echoes from Jericho's walls. Uh, brethren, we are only a few days away from the Feast of Trumpets. And is everybody here familiar with the Feast of Trumpets, the one we'll be observing on Monday? No, somebody's shaking their head. Okay. <laughs> well, whether or not you're familiar with it, um, this is one of the high holy days, in fact, the first one of the fall festivals that we'll be observing on Monday, the, the Feast of Trumpets on September 30th. This begins the fall festivals in God's plan of salvation. I will just turn quickly just to, uh, you know, make sure we know what we're talking about here. In Leviticus chapter 23, where all the festivals are listed, Leviticus chapter 23, uh, verses 23 to 25 speaks about this festival. So that's Leviticus chapter 23, starting in verse 23. It says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in which we are now on, God's, on the Hebrew calendar, God's calendar, in the seventh month, on the first day of the month, well, we're almost there, not quite there yet. In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall have a Sabbath rest, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a memorial of blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. So it's a commanded assembly, a time when God commands us to come together to worship him. It says you shall do no customary or servile work on it. So it's not a day in which we would normally, we, it's a day, on that day on Monday, Virtually everybody who is working will be going to work. But God says to us, as his people, you refrain from going to work. Come before me on that day to worship me. You shall do no customer work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. So this basically is what we are working towards coming on Monday, the Feast of Trumpets. And as we look at this um, holy day, the observance of this holy day, which points to the return of Jesus Christ, his second coming. And the Bible talks about that time when the trumpets will be blown, at that last trumpet. Trumpet will be blown, announcing the entrance of our King. Let's turn quickly to the Gospel of Matthew. The disciples were, were asking Christ, what would be the sign of his coming and the end of the age? And he gave them the answers in, in Matthew 24. But let's, let's pick up a few verses here in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, let's start in verse 30. Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. It says, Then, Christ speaking here, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. So this speaks of the time when Christ is coming back, his second coming, to rule and to reign. And it says, and he will send his angels with a great sound of trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds or the four corners from one end of heaven to the other. So it's also the time when Christ is coming to gather his elect, those whom he, have called, he has called in this, in this first calling, to gather them together and to offer to them the kingdom. Let's read a few more verses here. Uh, verse, skip down, Matthew 24, verse 36 through 39. It says, but of that day and hour, no one knows. The day when he's coming, brethren, it says no one knows. Only God the Father knows that day. So if anyone comes telling you, you know, he's coming back on 2029 on September 5th, you point them to this verse. It says of that day and that hour, no one knows. We have an idea of the season because it talks about looking at the fig tree, observing the times around us. You can get an idea of when his coming is near, and it is near. But the exact hour and time, no one knows. It's likely to be in this season of the year. It could also be on the day of trumpets. I believe that, um, but that doesn't necessarily say that that's what it will be. Of that day and that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but the Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark. 
So it will be business as usual. People will be going about their business doing what they're doing, going for work, having relationships, getting married, doing business, all these things. And it says, verse 39, and they did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man. So the reason for this message, brethren, is that as we stand on this side of the return of Jesus Christ, it behooves us to be ready. It's, it's incumbent on us, brethren, that we be in a state of readiness because we don't know when that trumpet will sound. None of us know. It will sound. The important thing is, will we be ready? Will I be ready? Or will it be the matter of being caught off guard? Panicking. Trying to set my life in order. Now is the time to set our lives in order. Now is the time to get ready. So, in this message, what I want to do is to look at this story of the walls of Jericho. The story with Joshua and the children of Israel when they marched around Jericho, as God instructed them to do, and when those walls came down, and see what lessons we can, some of the lessons we can glean from this story, because there's, there are a lot of parallels there to this end time, and the time just before the return of Jesus Christ, even to the, the, the whole uh, uh, time of, of the Feast of Trumpets. And so we can look at this and see what lessons we can draw from it to help us in our preparation to help us, brethren, that we can be ready when the Master returns. So for that then, let's go to the book of Joshua in chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. So as we know, Israel had crossed over the Jordan and they were on the way to the Promised Land. But Jericho, the city of Jericho, stood almost as a bastion in front of them. Uh, something, you know, an insurmountable obstacle, so to speak. And for some of them, they might have been thinking, how are we going to, how are we going to get to the promised land with Jericho in our way? And, you know, brethren, as we think about that, we can think about our own lives. What is the Jericho in our way? What is the obstacle that stands in our way? For some people, it's what they're going through, sicknesses, grave diseases. That could be the Jericho. For some, it's other things, relationships that are fall falling apart. For others, it's just trying to make ends meet. What is the Jericho, brethren, in your life? What are the Jerichos in my life that I have to deal with? We all have our Jericho that we have to face, brethren. The important thing is, what do we do when we come up on those Jerichos? So let's read here in the book of Joshua. I think I'll pick up the story. I just, I mean, go into chapter 6, but I think we better pick up from verse 14, verse 13 of chapter 5 of Joshua. It says, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And so, brethren, when we face our Jerichos, when we face that thing that is coming up against us, the question is, who is using this and for what purpose? Is it God that is putting this in your way? To mold us and to shape us? Or is it the enemy trying to destroy us? Are you for us or for adversaries? So he, that is the, the angel, answered and said, No, but as I come as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell down on his face to the earth, and he worshipped, and he said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandal, off your foot, for the place where you stand is holy ground. The very words which were spoken to Moses in the wilderness at that burning bush. And Joshua did so. And now we come into chapter 6. It says, Now Jericho was securely shut up because the children of Israel, 
because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. So Jer you may well say Jericho was under lockdown. So it's like a state of emergency. And no one could go out, no one could come in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hand, its king and the mighty men of valor. So this was it. Jericho stood in the path of Israel on their route to the promised land. A formidable force, something that seemed an insurmountable obstacle, at least from the human eyes. But God gave Joshua and the people of Israel this assurance that they could, they, that Jericho would fall. The walls would fall down and they could go in and conquer the city. It's interesting that one of the first things that jump out at me here is Joshua. His name, Joshua. In Hebrew, Yehoshua. And it means Jehovah, God is salvation. So here was a man commanding Israel, leading Israel. And he had the name, the name that pointed not to him, yes, but constantly kept him in reminder that the salvation that is going to come to Israel is not going to come because of Joshua. It's going to come because of the God of Israel. Amen. It's no different for us, brethren. Sometimes we can have our focus on individuals and on people, and we're looking to them to save us. We're looking to them to deliver us. But where should we look? Look up. Look to Jesus. Because he, the word says he's the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the one who will deliver us. No matter what battles we may have to face. And so here was the promise to Joshua and to the children of Israel. That they would take Jericho. God would give it into their hands. We have from our Joshua. Our high priest. Our king. Our commander. Not only are we going to take a city. But he's offering to us the entire world, the whole universe. It says the meek shall inherit this earth. God promises us, promises us brethren, this entire universe, far much more than what he, he was offering there to, to, to the children of Israel. Let's continue reading in chapter 6 of Joshua, verse 3. It says, you shall march around the city, all you men of valor. And you shall go all around the city once, and you will do this for six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram's horn before the ark. But the, se but the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. So that was the instruction God gave them. This is how he said they would capture Jericho. For six days, the men of valor, the leading warriors, and the priests, they would march around the city of Jericho. For six days, one day, they march around. Second day, they march around again. The third day, they would march around again until the sixth day. Then on the seventh day, they would go around the city seven times. The priests would blow the trumpet and the people should shout, and the walls of Jericho would fall. That was God's instruction and God's promise to them. I find it interesting again, as we think about types and antitypes and so on, uh, there, a lot of things echo here from, from this instruction and from this, what God was telling them to do. Why six days? Uh, for me, it reminds me that it talks about I think at the, in the epistle of Peter, one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. And so in this, what I see is a picture. God telling them to march around the city for six days. It's like the time that God has given mankind to have their own way, to rule and reign as they see fit, under the influence of the adversary. But there is coming a time when the rule of man will end. There's coming an end to that 6,000 years of man's reign under the influence of Satan. 
and there's coming a seventh day, a thousand years of the kingdom of God. And that's what we are looking forward to, brethren. That the kingdoms of this world are one day going to end. Man's misrule under the influence of Satan is going to come to an end. And the kingdom of God is going to be ushered in. That's what we look forward to. In terms of lessons, one of the first things that springs out here, brethren, is this. In the first few verses we have read here. Is that we should ask God to identify and align ourselves with his ways and his thoughts. Ask God to help us align our thoughts with his thoughts and our ways with his ways. Look at it. What did he tell them to do? He says, I'm going to hand Jericho over to you. March around this city six days, one for each, each of those days. And on the seventh day, march around it seven times. If I was a, a warrior or a general, and I got that instruction, I probably would ask, are you mad? What, what, what sense does that make? What is the sense of telling them to march around the city for six days and then march around it seven times on the seven days? That doesn't look like a winning war strategy to me. And from the human perspective, it does not, it does not seem to make any sense whatsoever. But you see, brethren, that is the difference. That is the thing on which it all turns, brethren. That the ways of God may seem silly, may seem foolish in the eyes of the world. But there's no better way. He says in Isaiah, For my ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, let's read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, because that is instructive to us. Verse 24 to 26. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 1 Corinthians 1, 24 to 26. It says, For as you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. Look at this audience. Which of you have noble birth? Which of you, have, which of you are coming from some rich and famous family? Any of you? Maybe I don't know. I mean, you know, sometimes people have very interesting backgrounds, but they don't make it known. Ordinary folks. Ordinary folks. If it were left up to some of the so-called wise of this world to choose whom they would call, they would probably not have called me. They probably would not have called you. They'd be looking for people who are more famous People who are quote unquote more intelligent, people who are more learned, people who are rich, and people who are more powerful. But it says God has a different way of doing things. He has chosen, verse 27, the foolish things of this world. It's not that we are foolish, but from the world's perspective, we may appear to be foolish. He has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of this world to put to shame the things which are mighty. Amen. And the base things of this world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are. Why? So that we don't have to boast. We don't have to boast that whatever he achieves through us, it is our strength or our making or our doing. Think about it again, brethren. Come on Monday, we, are, we, 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 we plan to observe this festival, a time when the rest of the world is busy. They're going to work. The, the start of the working week for most folks, from their perspective, you tell them, oh, I'm going to church. I'm going to have a church service. It's a high holiday. What's that? For the average person, it looks silly. It seems to make no sense. But that, it is, that is how it is, brethren. The wisdom of God is far wiser than men. What may seem foolish to the world is actually wisdom in the sight of God. And so, what we need to do, brethren, and to keep asking God, is to help us to look foolish for Him. Help us to look foolish for Him. 
Because it's one thing if, if we get the applause and the praise of men by going contrary to what God says. And in the end, destruction. Far wiser it is to be ridiculed by the world. Far wiser it is to be ostracized by the world. Far wiser it is to be considered fools by this world's reasoning. But in the sight of God, he finds us to be obedient. He finds us to be compliant. He finds us to be dedicated to him and to do what he says, even if it makes us look silly. So that's my encouragement to you, brethren. Whatever people may say, whether it's your family members, whether it's your neighbors, whether it's your co-workers, doesn't matter who it is, they will jeer you and laugh at you because you decide to obey God. And if it looks foolish to obey God, keep on obeying Him. Because you can never, you will never lose for obeying Him. We will never fail for obeying Him. But if we do otherwise, brethren, the end could be nothing like what we really want. So let's just ask God to help us to align our thoughts and our ways with him. Let's go back to um, Joshua chapter 6. And let's pick up now. Let's uh, stop with verse 4. Let's continue. Verse 5. Then it shall come to pass when they make a loud blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of Jericho will fall down flat, and the people shall go up, every man straight before him. And so what it speaks of here is that at the sound of that seventh trumpet, that on that seventh day when the trumpets would sound, it says the wall of Jericho's would fall. As I read through this, my mind immediately jumps to the book of Revelation. When it talks about those trumpet plagues in Revelation chapters 8, 9. Because those trumpet plagues talk about things that will be happening in this world. Things that will happen to this world. A world that is in rebellion and hostility against God. Just as the city, the city Jericho was. The city of Jericho was like the, the type of this world that was in hostility against God and against the people of God, and their demise was, was imminent, so also, brethren, is the destruction of this world that fights against the people of God, that fights against God and His way. You know, we're going we're gonna to go over to Revelation 11, uh, but um, I, I, just a little bit later. I just take a, a little sidebar here to talk about trumpets. You know, trumpets were often used for several different things in the, in the Old Testament times, in the times of the children of Israel. You know, it was often used trumpets to sound an alarm. You know, the, the children are encamping, and if there's danger or whatever threatening uh, the, 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 the tribes, they would sound the alarm to let people know there's danger, imminent danger. Sometimes they would gather the people together. You know, they would sound trumpets, for instance, on the, on the high holy days, on the Sabbath. To, to gather the people together for worship or for other important occasions. They would use it at, at coronation ceremonies um, when the king would be crowned, like when uh, David being crowned king and, and so on, Solomon. There's sounding of the trumpet. And so they have, and, and of course, the call to war, the, the trumpet would be sounded. So there are all these things that trumpets were used for. It was no different here at the walls of Jericho. Something important was about to happen. The children of Israel knew because God had given the promise to them. But the people of Jericho did not know this. The people of Jericho did not know what was about to hit them. They were in ignorance. And so, brethren, the lesson for us is not to be like Jericho. is not to be like this world that is just going about business as usual, but is totally ignorant of what is on the horizon totally clueless of what is about to happen. The people of Jericho could see the children of Israel daily marching around their city. 
And they must have wondered, and I, I, I guess people must have been guessing, what are they up to? Are they coming to attack us? Then why are they marching around? What, 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 are, are, what, what is this? What is this strategy? What are they up to? They didn't know. They did not know what was about to take place. Just as this world, brethren, is in darkness. Let's read, uh, go back here into Matthew chapter 24. Matthew 24. Matthew 24 and verse 6. It says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of war. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then skip down to verse 13. But he who endures to the end shall be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. You may say that with Israel marching around Jericho, the walls of Jericho, the gospel is actually being preached to them, but they were not hearing. They couldn't understand. It was falling on deaf ears. They didn't understand what was happening. But there was one person who understood, and, and her family. That is Rahab the harlot. She knew what was about to happen. I guess some of you were caught by surprise. <laughs> uh, you know, but just in a little way, just in a little way. You see, the world does not expect. The world does not expect. They don't know what's about to strike. Just as Jericho did not know what was about to strike them. All they could see was the Israelites marching around their city, around the city wall. But they had no idea what was about to happen. It's important, brethren, for us that we watch the signs and be prepared so that we are not caught off guard. It should not happen to us, brethren. When that trumpet sound, it should be for us a time of rejoicing, not a time of panicking, not a time of trying to get our houses in order, not a, try, not a time of trying to set our lives straight. Now is the time. Now is the time for us. Rahab was prepared. Because you remember when the spies had first gone to, 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 to spy out the city, she was the one who hosted them. She, she, she hid them in her, on, on her roof. And they gave her this promise that when we come back to take this city, you hang this scarlet thread or cord out your, over your wall from your window. So we would know that when we come to take the city, you and your family, you and your household would not be destroyed, but the rest of the city would. Rahab was prepared, brethren, and she was not caught off guard. She was actually waiting for that moment. She eagerly anticipated that moment. That's something she was looking forward to, and so should we, brethren, looking forward to his coming. Because we know that it is our redemption. It is our time of deliverance. It is our time, brethren, of ultimate victory over the adversary. Rahab prepared. I didn't have a scarlet cord, but I just want something to remind us. Rahab had her scarlet cord, and she hung it out the window so that when those spies came back, they could see that cord. That scarlet cord, brethren, is symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ. It's symbolic of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed to save us, brethren. And when we have the blood on us, 
when that angel of death comes, brethren, as it did in ancient Egypt, it will pass over us. We will be spared. We will be saved. Rahab and her household were saved because she had that cord hanging out. It is interesting that one of the words for hope in Hebrew is tikva. Tikva. Number, you can look it up in Strong's. Number 8615. And it literally means a cord or attachment. A cord or attachment. So Rahab had an attachment to the, to the God of Israel. She hung that cord out as a symbol which identified her with Israel. And the God of Israel who was sending his people to save her and her household. Brethren, let's hang on to our cord of hope and not let go. The enemy is going to bring all kinds of things to try to disrupt that relationship. But let's hold on, brethren. Let's put our faith and our trust in the blood of Jesus Christ, Amen. his saving blood. So no matter what the storms are, we hang on and we hold out this cord of hope, which says, Father, I am your child. I am your child. Save me from this crooked and perverse generation. Deliver me from my enemies. We can call on him, brethren, when we have this cord of hope. We hang our hope on Jesus. We hang our hope on God our Father, who is able to deliver us. So when the spies came, brethren, they were able to save Rhea and her household. So as we watch and as we prepare, brethren, as we watch the signs, we see what is happening in the world around us. Be cognizant, yes, of what's happening in the world around you. But we also have to watch El Numero Uno. We have to watch ourselves. We have to watch our spiritual condition. We have to watch our relationship with God. Is it intact or is it teetering? Is it on a sure foundation or is it on shifting sand? We have to watch that, brethren. Luke 24, Luke 21, verse 34. This is also a part of the preparation that we need to do as believers. Luke 21 and verse 34. Luke 21, verse 34. It says, But take heed, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighted down with carousing. <laughs> That's a word I used to hear my mother use, carousing. Uh, she usually uses it in reference to the company you're, you know, you're with, some company that you shouldn't be with. She says, don't go carousing with those kind of people who are doing all kinds of stuff. She says, no carousing, a carousing and drunkenness and the cares of this life that that day come upon you unexpectedly. So we have both also to watch brethren and to pray. Because, you know, even the legitimate things in life, just earning a living, just earning your daily bread and taking care of things, which are legitimate things. But if we are not careful about it, brethren, those things can cloud our vision. And they can take, just take up so much of our time that the real important things in life, our relationship with God, takes a back seat and begin to crumble, begin to fall apart. So let us watch the signs of the times. As Rehab did, she was watching, watching and waiting, and no doubt praying for when she and her household uh, would, be would be delivered. Now let's get back um, to chapter 6 of uh, Joshua. And let's pick up here in uh, verse 6. It says, So Joshua the son of Nun called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed and march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the Ark of the Lord. So what we see here was the presence of God in their midst, the Ark of the Covenant. Does you remember about the ark? What, what, what was in that Ark of the Covenant? There were 
uh, three significant things which are in the Ark of the Covenant. Does anyone remember? The commandments, the rod of Aaron, hmm? no, the, the manna. Yeah, the, the, the manna, there's the manna, yeah, the rod of the Aaron's rod that budded, and, the, and the, the commandments. All these brethren are, it, it emphasizes or it, it encapsulates God's presence, the commandments, the standards by which we must live. The manifesto of the kingdom of God. These, these will be the laws of the kingdom of God. Aaron's rod, a symbol of God's authority. And manna, that God is the one who divinely provides for his children. Every need he's able to meet from his limitless riches and glory. So they had the presence of God with them as they marched symbolically in the Ark of the Covenant. Verse 8, so it, so it was when Joshua had spoken to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horn before the Lord, they advanced and they blew the trumpets and the Ark of the Covenant, they blew the trumpet and the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priests who blew the trumpet and the rear guard came after the Ark while the priests continued blowing the trumpet. So we see here again God's uh, defense, God's, God's protection was with them. Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, you shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall any word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, shout, then you shall shout. Not a mysterious thing. I, I'm not too sure what all of that means or why God told them, don't shout. Uh, just keep silent while they were marching around. I guess it's, it's even more to confuse the enemy. <laughs> because may, maybe if they were chattering and saying things, you know, maybe the enemy might, they, they, the people of Jericho might have got some clue as to what was about to happen. Who knows, they might have talked about, you know what's going to happen in this, because, you know, said, don't talk about this. Just march around the city. Some might have been tempted to say, just wait until the seventh day, and, and that could have gone you know, to, to the ears of the people of Jericho. But anyway, whatever it means, uh, this was what God said to them, that they should, keep, they should keep silent until the appointed time. So, they, so he had the ark of the Lord, so, so he had the ark of the Lord circle the city, going around it once, then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, verse 12, and the priests took, the, took up the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests bearing seven trumpets of ram's horns before the ark of the Lord went on continually and they blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them, but the rear guard came after the ark of the Lord while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. And they did this for six days. Verse 15. But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early about the dawning of the day. And they marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it was so, when the priests blew the trumpets, that Joshua said to the people, Shout! For the Lord has given you the city. And we know what happened, brethren. They shouted, and the walls of Jericho came down. It says in verse 17, Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, and all who are in it, only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all who are with her in the house, because she did, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And so, this is what took place on that seventh day, when the priests blew, blew the trumpets, when they marched around the city seven times and blew the trumpets. And as I said, the echoes here goes to the book of Revelation. 
on this and the seven trumpet play so just let's uh, turn there for a little while all right before we get there let's, let's just read this because this I think this one sums it up all right let's, uh, let's skip down to verse uh, uh, verse 20 uh, back in back in uh, chapter 6 of Joshua it says so the people shouted the priests blew the trumpets, and it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. Now we turn to Revelation chapter uh, 11, which I referred to earlier, but we didn't read it. Revelation 11, verse 15 through 19. Because just as Jericho fell, brethren, this is what is going to happen to this world in which we live. The trumpets, that seven trumpet is going to sound, announcing the entrance of our king. This world and its governments are going to fall. Revelation chapter 11, verse 15 through 19. It says, Then the seventh angel, the seventh angel sounded, and there was loud voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the 24 elders who sat before God on their thrones fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks, O Lord God Almighty, the one who is, the one who was, and who is to come, because you have taken your great power and reigned. So this is what is coming, brethren. The return of Jesus Christ, the establishment of the kingdom of God at that seventh trumpet. So Jericho was getting his warning, but they didn't understand, understood the warnings. This world is getting its warnings, and they have no idea what is about to happen. They have no idea what is about to happen. Only Rahab. Only Rahab and her family were safe and were saved. The walls, brethren, they are walls in our way, but they will come down. That's the promise that God gives us, not by human effort, but only by the spirit power of God. I asked earlier, what are the walls in your life? What are the walls in my life that need to come down? It is only by the power and the spirit of God, brethren, that that will happen. Zechariah 4 and verse 6 tells us, It is not by might nor by power, God says, but by my spirit. It is only by this power, the spirit of God, that these walls will come down. You know, if we reflect again on, on Jericho, this was a walled city. I, I read somewhere it says the wall was probably about 30 feet high and in some places about 14 feet wide. So it wasn't just a, it was, it wasn't a little flimsy thing. This was a fortified city. And God told him to march around the city. And on that seventh day when they'd march around it seven times and the priests would blow the trumpet and the people would shout and it said the walls of Jericho fell. And they were able to go in and to take the city. You know, people come up with all kinds of explanations as to how this actually happened. Uh, some talk about some sonic boom. Some talk about some earthquake. I think I was reading in, in the note in my Bible here, it said some people believe it was some kind of an earthquake or something that took place. I don't know. I don't know about that. I know what I read here. It says God instructed them, march around the city for six days, March around on the seventh day for seven times. It says the priest would blow the trumpet and it says the wall would fall down. How God did it? I can't tell you. But I know he did it. And the record said the walls fell. So brethren, we have to come to that place where we entrust our lives to God. Where we entrust everything to him. And have this confidence that he's able to tear down whatever the walls are 
that the enemy places in our way. That the walls of Jericho in our lives will come down when we trust God. Rahab and her household put their trust, their faith, and their confidence in God. And they were saved. Uh, another explanation I, I, I got here was that, you know, she lived on the city wall. Uh, so the ex explanation was that that part of the wall did not crumble. The rest of it crumbled. So they were able to go in and to save Rahab and her family. God works in mysterious ways, his wonders to perform. Uh, that God could make all the part of the wall fall down, except that one part where he had this woman and her household. He promised he would save them, and they were not injured in any way. The spies were able to go in, they were able to go in and to save her and her family. Something else that comes across to us, brethren, or should come across to us, is that God's promises are sure. God's promises are sure. If God says, I will save you, he means I will save you. If it takes heaven and earth to save you, he will put all of that into saving you. He will not leave any stone unturned in his effort to save us, to come to our aid and to come to our rescue. Nothing too difficult for God. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20. 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. When God says it, brethren, he will do it. What the song says, that if when Jesus say yes, nobody can say no. When Jesus say yes, it says nobody can say no. Doesn't matter what the enemy is going to bring up against us. God gives you the assurance. God gives you his word. He will keep it. It's just for us to keep our side of the, of, of the agreement, of the covenant. And so we see that Rahab and her family were saved. The lesson for us there is that salvation she, is a free gift. It's a free gift, but it comes with certain conditions. We have to turn and repent from our sins, renounce our sins and our sinful way of life. Turn from it. Confess it to God. Ask him to forgive us. Turn from that way of life. And then we have to ex express that faith and that confidence in God and determine and commit our ways to obeying him for the rest of our lives. That's what it's all about. Yes, salvation is free, but it has a heavy price. It calls for the price of repentance. It calls for the price of obedience. And it calls for the price of faith. Walking the rest of our lives with him, with God. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's read a little bit about Rahab here and Jericho. Uh, Hebrews 11, verse uh, 30, 31. Hebrews 11, verse 30. It says, for we... Am I the right place? Oh, that's 10. Sorry. Hebrews 11, verse 30. It says, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they were encircled for seven days. So it was an act of faith, brethren. The children of Israel put their trust in God. God gave him the assurance, do this. Do this which seems silly. Do this which seems to make no sense. Trust me, when you do that, I'm going to make the walls of Jericho fall down. And they, they, they obeyed. They did what God said, and the walls of Jericho fell. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell, fell down after they were encircled for seven days. By faith, the harlot Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe when she had received the spies with peace. So here it says, it refers to her as Rahab the harlot. Seemed like that label stuck with her for quite a while. But despite the label, she had the faith. She had the faith to believe God, to believe the promise that God gave through Joshua and the spies, that they would come back and save her. And I'm sure she must have done something between then and their coming in order to be saved. 
Yes, she hung her scarlet cord out her window. But I don't think it was just a matter of hanging that cord out, brethren. I, it doesn't say it in the scripture, but I am convinced that Rahab changed her life. She must have turned her life around and handed her life over to God, to the God of Israel. Because there's, there's another the other part of the scriptures that talk about how all these nations were, were so terrified when, when Israel, the army of Israel were coming and they, they, you know, what they had done with these other cities along the way. And the people of Jericho knew that too. But there's somewhere, I can't remember exactly where, but I think it's somewhere there in the book of Joshua too. It talked about Rahab. She, she knew that it was God who was giving these cities into, into the hand of the children of Israel. And so to, for her, this wasn't some, some strange God. She saw this as, as the sovereign God, the almighty God who was on the side of Israel. And she wanted to align herself with that God. So she must have changed her life, brethren. She could not have been continuing in harlotry. She's listed here in this hall of faith. She had faith in the God of Israel to deliver her, and he did deliver her. And so, another lesson, and if maybe this is the final one, that springs out to me, is that sometimes, brethren, our past can get in the way of our destiny, but only if we allow it. Our past can stymie, stop us from coming into our destiny, but only if we allow it. We all have a past, and for some of us it's worse than, than, than others. I know mine, a filthy past. I've said it before, and I don't have to tell you what the filthiness of my past was. God knows it, but I always remember what Paul says. Such were some of you, but you have been washed. You have been cleansed in the blood of the Lamb. And so the enemy will always want to bring up our past in front of us to shame us. The song says, I'm trading my shame for the goodness of the Lord. I'm trading my sorrow for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my past for the future that God holds out to me. And so should all of us, brethren, not let the enemy throw the past our, our sordid pass into our face and tell us, who do you think you are? Going around as if you're some good, good person. I know where you come from. I know what you were. Yes, God knows what we were. But what is more important, God knows what he's promising us and what we can become. That is what matters, brethren. Rahab was not stopped by your past. You could keep on calling her harlot. Rahab the harlot. Rahab the harlot. That didn't stop her. She was saved by the grace of God. And so she would not allow her past of harlotry to stop her from coming into the promise of God. Don't let your past stop you, brethren, from coming into the glorious future that God is, has in store for you. Rahab didn't allow that to stop her. And it is interesting that she is also listed in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Uh, we read here in Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew 1. Is it Matthew 1 and verse 5? I think it is. Yes. Solomon begot Boaz by Rahab. It's the same Rahab. Rahab the harlot. Salmon begot, Bohab. Salmon begot Boaz by Rahab. Boaz begot Obed by Ruth. And Obed begot Jesse. And you go right down to Jesus Christ himself. And so it doesn't matter where we're coming from, brethren. It's not where we're coming from. It's where we're going. It's not what you were in the past. It's what you are to become. Let's make sure that we hang on to the promises of God. Let's make sure that we look at our lives, that as God looks at us. Yes, when he looks at us, yes, we were like, our lifestyle was just like filthy rags. But he calls us to trade that in 
for the garments of righteousness. He calls us to trade in our past for a glorious future. Let's focus on that, brethren, and not let that stop us, not let our past stop us from coming into the future that God has in store for us. And I'm about to end. Let us learn from our predecessors, brethren. Let us learn from the scriptures we read here, because it says these things which were written were written for our learning, that we should learn from them, brethren, and not make the same mistakes that others made. The people of Jericho perished because they didn't, they didn't watch the warning signs. The people of Jericho perished because they didn't have a relationship with God. Rahab and her family were saved, brethren, because they had a connection through the blood of Jesus Christ. They had a connection and they were saved. Rahab and her family were saved, brethren, because they believed. They trusted God to deliver them, and he did. The walls of Jericho fell, brethren, because the children of Israel had faith in the God of Israel, in their God, to do battle for them. Let's remember, the battle is not ours to fight, brethren, but God's. Just as he did with, in other instances, as is recorded in the scripture. You remember the other one where the army, I think with Jeho King Jehoshaphat, they went out praising the Lord. <laughs> they went out praising the Lord. And God confused the enemy in the midst of all of this, defeated the enemy. Let's align ourselves with God. I'll close with um, Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews 3, verse 8 through 13. It says, Harden not your hearts, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 8 through 13. Harden not your hearts as in the provocation, in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, they proved me, they saw my works for 40 years. How long have you seen God's works, brethren, in your life? How long, brethren? You know, if I had confessed, I've been walking this way for over 40 years. And sometimes I come up in situations in life and I forget that God has been, I've been walking with God for 40 years. God, is, God has been by my side for 40 years. And sometimes some little things just come up. And somehow I seem to forget, we, why, are you, why are you reacting in, in this way? Has God not been walking with you for these past 40 years? Why now are you in a state of panic? Why now are you in a state of confusion? Let's not forget the works of God, brethren. Chapter, verse 10, it says, Wherefore I was grieved with this generation and said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. We need to get to know God's ways, brethren. How he works, how he thinks. I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Then it says in verse 12, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief. Unbelief. We believe God for our salvation. And we trust them. And yet so many times, brethren, other things come up. And the word of God, God says, I am with you. I will not leave or forsake you. And yet, there are so often times we don't believe him. We don't always believe him for our healing. We don't always believe him for our deliverance. We don't always believe him to work things out for us. But we should. My prayer for myself and for all of us is that we would believe him. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But do this instead. Exhort one another daily while it is called today. Encourage one another, brethren. I thank you for your prayers. 
And I thank you for the encouragement which some of you give. I, I really appreciate it. Let us do that one for another. Encourage one another. Exhort one another to love and to good works. Exhort one another daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. May God help us, brethren, to learn from the example, the example of the walls of Jericho falling, so that the walls in our lives, when we put our trust in God, when we obey Him, when we commit our ways to Him, we will see those walls fall, and we will have the victory over every force of darkness. May God bless you all.